Hey, hey. Hey everyone, how's it going? So uh, just as a heads up, I've got a light case of plague, so I apologize in advance if I sneeze into this microphone, you have to burn it. Um, so yeah, um, shalom. I, I, put, I put this slide in front of every presentation I do this thing. If you've seen me talk before, you know this, but I'll just like stand, I'll turn my back to you, and I'll just kind of like stare at the cat and do this for a bit. <laughs> I don't know, man. <laughs> um, but I highly suggest if you do talk, like come up with some weird ritual like this so that you can like chill out on stage. Um, it doesn't have to be psychedelic, but it helps. <laughs> so as I said, my name is Miles. Um, I work at Google as a developer advocate focused on Node, on GCP, which is the Google Cloud platform. I got a laser. I know. Um, it's worth saying, and this is another good one if you work for a big company, always put this at the bottom of a talk that's not like a product pitch. The opinions expressed in this talk are solely my own. Cool. Dear Diary, today we broke NPM. <laughs> this thing's pretty magical. I, I heard that this was a vodka factory. <laughs> So it turns out that an API that we deprecated in 2010 um, was never actually deprecated. We just did a docs-only deprecation, but we never did anything in core, um, which was specifically fs.read. Um, we deprecated using a string interface, because um, fs.read actually expects you to give it a file descriptor. So there would be no reason to ever give it a string. So you know, we did what would be expected, and uh, we deprecated it, but because we are good stewards of the community. We didn't just like remove it. We added a warning. Um, and at the time, um, you know, we have this thing, an internal util called print deprecation. And we just basically uh, caught where there was an error when this happened and we printed deprecation warning. This was just, you know, a little warning that would go into your console. Give you a heads up, it's going to go. The change landed. It was pretty non controversial. I didn't really think too much about it. Um, and then it broke NPM on master. So um, <laughs> I know what you're thinking. It did not break NPM Substack, NPM Viznup, and, or NPM Xmas. The three really amazing Easter eggs. You should dig through the code and see how they're implemented. Um, but you know those are not the most important part. The most important part is that you can npm install. Um, so we found out that it was actually due to the way in which GracefulFS works. So what GracefulFS would do is it would go and um, call a not heavily documented part of core that would actually give you the source code of our internal modules. It would then spin up a, v a VM instance. It would throw the code in there. It would execute execute it, make a new FS instance, monkey patch the new FS instance, and then replace the reference to it. Now, this is great because what this Let's Grace LSS do is like do all sorts of monkey patching but not affect the way FS works for you know other stuff. Um, and this is great except for the way um, that we were using this new internal util. So when it would try to execute internal util, it would just explode. And that's not good. So we came up with a short-term solution to give people time, um, which was literally to copy and paste all of util.deprecate into that FS file so we could at least keep the warning. It's ugly, it's big, it's gross, it's terrible, it makes me sad, but at least npm install worked. Also, as a follow-up, we ended up adding a new test to our CI that literally just runs npm npm install in an empty module to make sure we never break npm install again. <laughs> How are we to know that a warning would break the world? Um, so, Canary in the gold mine is what saved the day. Um, and you're probably asking, what exactly is Canary in the gold mine? It's an acronym. Well, SITKIM. <laughs> I'm ahead of myself here. SITKIM is an acronym that stands for Canary in the Goldmine. And before any of you correct me, as we've gotten issues open before, yes, we know the expression is Canary in the Coal Mine. Um, the name was come up by James Snell, who's a TSC and CTC member who I used to work closely with. And when prompted as to why he picked this name, he simply replies that he thinks it sounds good. 
But uh, SIDGAM is a smoke testing utility that we use in the Node project to make sure that we don't break your code and that the ecosystem remains healthy. Um, what it does is it grabs the source code for a number of named modules. It will then run npm install. It will run npm test. And then it will report the results. Um, we run SIDGAM in CI, um, building a specific SHA on the node tree. So we can pick um, a branch. We can pick a SHA. We can pick, um, I guess that's about it. But no, we can use a PR URL as well. But it's like really hard to remember the syntax. Um, but you, we then run the test suite of a specific module and report the results. Um, this is an example of using it um, with basic logging. Um, and we have various verbosity settings. So at the top, you can see we're using SIDGAM on a module called Oh My God, I Pass. It's an actual module I published. It has nothing in it except for NPM test exits zero. It always passes. Um, and below, you can see it running with verbose and NP with verbosity set to silly. You can see all the different things that are distracting normally, but can be good if we're running into network problems or things aren't working. Um, we can also publish the results in Markdown. You can see here um, we're running it on a module called Oh My God, I Fail which is a fork of, oh my god, I passed, but it exits one. <laughs> um, and you could see, you know, we've got some really awesome emoji going on there. And this is used when we want to actually just print the results of something and throw it into a GitHub issue. Um, but there's actually a number of different reporters. We also report using TAP. How many people here know TAP? Um, so TAP is the test anything protocol comes out of the Perl community, which also some of the ideas from Sitcom were heavily inspired by. Um, now, uh, the test anything protocol, normally we would think about TAP as like node TAP, which is a module by Isaacs, which is a testing framework. Um, but TAP itself is actually, um, it's a standard for how you write the output of test reports. And there's a number of different reporters, such as Jenkins and Travis and any number of different command line utilities that can take TAP output and then render it nicely so that you can actually do introspection into the results. Um, so we have a TAP reporter, and everything was nice and great with TAP. TAP is great in the sense that it's a stream-based reporter. So if your test suite like fails halfway through, um, you know the TAP results will still get like you know pushed out in stream to the disk, so you can find out you know where things blew up. But we use Jenkins, and it turned out that Jenkins is weird in that it takes your TAP results and embeds that in an XML file, and every time you go to load a page, it parses the TAP into another XML file and then loads that XML file in the parser. And when you have 10 to 15 megabyte XML files, um, everything breaks and you get lots of 500s and everyone's sad. And the, my, yeah, I broke Node CI and it was bad. So we wrote an X unit par, uh, reporter, which makes me really sad because it's XML, but it works. Um, the biggest problem with XML over TAP as far as like uh, robustness for testing is that you notice because it's XML, you have opening and closing tags. So there is really no way to have kind of like a partial thing working. So like if for some reason halfway through the tests, some module actually caused SITCOM to do a core dump, um, we're just going to have no results. Or you're going to have to go like digging through all of like the report details in Jenkins, and that's scary. Um, but you know, this worked. So we have all these various reporters, Markdown, TAP, and XUnit. Um, and we also have a, a utility called SITCOM All, which is a recursive thing that allows us to um, test 86 of the top modules in the ecosystem ranging. Well, you know what? How about I just write them out? So this includes core ecosystem modules such as Request, Express, Body Parser, Graceful FS, Level, Async, WS, Socket IO, Serial Port, Lodash, and Underscore. And I promise, I didn't do that on purpose, Q and Blue Word being cut off. This is meant to be 16.9. <laughs> You know, I, I voted yes on Util Promise 5. <laughs> Also includes modules for streams, uh, readable stream, through to, split to, duplexer to, BL, binary split, SAX, duplexify, pumpify, and from to. You may not have heard all of these modules, but a lot of them are probably sitting in your node modules folders. Um, we have modules uh, for front end testing, uh, for front end and tooling, um, including Browserfy, VinylFS, Gulp, React, jQuery, Node SAS, Ember CLI, Commander, and I hate calling it Pug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not allowed to. 
Um, one of the things I'm really actually a big fan of is this one, Vinyl FS. How many people know Vinyl FS? Vinyl FS is like what's under the hood in Gulp that allows you to do like streaming FS stuff. In fact, Gulp is really just like a super loose shimmer on Vinyl FS. So if you wanted to like not have all the crud, but wanted to have like Gulp's syntax as far as like being able to do piping over file system stuff like that, you can just use Vinyl FS directly. And in fact, Vinyl FS, well, you know what, we'll get to that later. Um, it includes natively compiled modules. This is a really important part of our ecosystem to test. Um, this includes serial port, level down, bcrypt, node SAS, SQLite, electron prebuilt, FFI, and node report. Um, these natively compiled modules are really important when we want to actually be able to test that we have not broken the ABI. This is what allowed us in Node 6 to upgrade from V8 5.0 to 5.1. It's what allowed us in Node 7 to upgrade from V8 5.4 to 5.5, which gave you all async await. Um, we have another Sitkin ABI smoker that we did that actually uses one version of NPM to NPM install all the modules, and then another version of NPM, uh, uh, did I say NPM? One version of Node and NPM to install all the modules, and then another version of Node and NPM to run the tests. The idea being that if the ABI is compatible, we shouldn't have like random symbol errors and stuff. And sometimes there are. And then that means we don't land new versions of V8. So why exactly are we doing this? Every test in the Node.js ecosystem is an integration test for core. This is the most important part. Any piece of code that we can run that tests functionality and test expected behavior is a test for Node. Now, we can't go and like take every single one of these tests and figure out a way to like turn them into exact tests for core. But this like mass ecosystem smoking um, allows us to find the edge cases that we're not testing in core and then convert them when necessary. Um, so by running an ecosystem test against specific versions of Node, we can find out what's going to break before it breaks. This is like, this is heavy shit. <laughs> so, we run Sitkin on CI for all seven of our major changes and releases. If it doesn't pass, the change doesn't land. Um, now, it turns out sometimes this hasn't been true for Semver Major. I was actually found out the hard way that it isn't true, but I opened an issue on the CTC repo today to make sure that we do run it on every Semver Major change. Um, but releases don't go out in general if we find things that are broken. We will either work with the module authors to make sure we fix their modules, or alternatively, we'll go forward and revert changes that are necessary before a release. So how does it work? I love this one. If any of you have seen Pee Wee's Big Adventure, it's a great movie. Soundtrack by Danny Elfman of Oingo Boingo. It's a real band name. So we do a lot of rapping. NPM view. We wrap that. NPM view is what you can use. You type the name of the module and it'll give you, you know, like essentially the package JSON and the list of all the information that's important about the module. NPM pack. We wrap that. NPM pack will actually, you say NPM pack and a module, and it will give you back a tarball of the module that you named. Uh, NPM install, <laughs> we wrap that. I'll even go as far as to not explain NPM install to any of you, because I respect every single one of you. <laughs> NPM test, you ready? You're going to do this one with me? We wrap it. We wrap that. We wrap that. This one's a pupperito. <laughs> We're going to just watch this for the rest of my talk, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, so cute. OK. So you may be thinking to yourselves, um, when I was saying wrapping, maybe I wasn't explicit. We literally just wrap the calls to NPM and child processes. And that's really sad and scary. Why are we using so many child processes? And it's because NPM already does all this stuff. And uh, every build that we do in CI already has NPM. Um, and the NPM CLI API is like, NPM does not offer a support contract for its internal APIs. So if you try to like require any of the bits of NPM itself, it's not supported. But I'm pretty sure that npm install and npm pack and all those lifecycle stuff are never going to change. So that's why we wrap them. Uh, npm is actually in the process right now of breaking out some of this core functionality into modules that are reliable. And I'm really excited about being able to replace child processes. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in Canary in the Goldmine, you know about these modules. This could be a really great way to send some pull requests. Hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Um, so dear diary. Today, body parser broke. <laughs> How many of you know body parser? 
Okay, cool. I don't need to go through the whole thing, but body parser is in Express. And Express is used everywhere. So if we break body parser, we almost break the internet. We definitely break, break PayPal. Um, so query string. Query string is an API that we have in Node for parsing query strings. And um, internally in query string, we were doing this thing where we would call split on the separator. And then if we had more things in the, in the array than the max length, we just shorten the array. Now, you know, it's reasonable to do it that way, but this is not actually like a really efficient way to do things. Um, creating lots of garbage, you're doing extra processing that's unnecessary, and it turns out that um, string.prototype.split has a second argument you can give it, which is max length, and we can hand all that over to C++ and just know that you know we, we just don't have to waste all this. And when we're talking about, and the reason I mentioned you know, kind of the dependency chain of body parser, um, or of query, query string, query string is extremely hot code in our ecosystem. So if we can improve its speed even by like three to five percent, that's not an insignificant um, change that we can make across you know the entire internet. So we're into those kinds of things. So we did this change. We thought it was going to be fine, but we didn't think about infinity. <laughs> so how many mathematicians do we have in here? Yeah, I know math's weird. <laughs> So it turns out that the second argument that query string dot, um, prototype dot split expects is an integer. And it turns out that when you infer an integer, when you infer an infinity to an integer, it infers to zero, <laughs> which is the accurate mathematical thing that infinity would do. Although I would argue it's one because it's everything, but no, zero is everything. <laughs> so when we would do um, a, a parse on max keys infinity before, we would get one. Afterwards, we would get zero, and now it's pedantically mathematically correct. I don't think this is what people meant. <laughs> so the, the thing that we learned from this was that there was a small um, test inside of Express, because the maintainers of Express just like test everything. And in Body Parser, they tested to see what would happen if you pushed infinity in and made sure it was fine. We didn't test this edge case. So we were able to actually find that breaking thing in Body Parser. We were able to find um, that test. We were able to make that test um, take out all the Body Parser bits and just be like a raw node test. And we literally just added an if statement to check if max keys was infinity and just hand back and like put nothing in there. Um, but the, the real important part here is that like a really, really, a patch that should not break anything could potentially like be extremely disruptive. And this kind of smoke testing can catch those edge cases and they can catch, like we even had code coverage there. We had 100% code coverage. Like it does, like code coverage like is good, but like it turns out that logic is weirder than good. So another one, last one for you tonight, Dear Diary. Today we accidentally broke gulp. I don't know if any of you have seen the IT crowd, but that show is amazing. <laughs> so um, now when Node 7 was coming, we decided to revert that hack in, in files because it made us really sad. Um, here's, the, here's the commit that just removes all that code. Because it turned out that GracefulFS did an upgrade in GracefulFS 3, and they changed the way in which they were doing things um, so that it wouldn't break. Um, and after uh, failures on Canary in the gold mine, we decided to do an ecosystem scan to figure out what was going on. And it turned out that it broke 5% of all modules on NPM. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Even more so, um, as we put the list down, it turned out like we went through and updated a whole bunch of projects. But Gulp 3 was significantly affected because Gulp 3 was running on an old version of Vinyl FS, and that old version of Vinyl FS was tacked to um, an old version of Graceful FS uh, 2. And so, because of that, now we get into like the really weird combinatorial complexity of modules and why it's really hard to break anything in Node. Um, we had no way actually to work with the Gulp people because. For them to upgrade the dependency in the old version of VinylFS, they were not comfortable with the test suite that they had. 
And the new version of Gulp was not able to upgrade the version of Final FS because they also didn't have the coverage to do it. So over on Gulp's side, they weren't comfortable or confident in just like bumping the modules because it wasn't just bumping one module, it was bumping like a whole suite of dependencies. Um, and one of the things that's like important to think here is that it was like a massive breakage in the Gulp ecosystem. Um, so Gulp is 28% directly affected and 42% indirectly affected. So like this literally just broke Gulp, period. And one of the biggest challenges here is that a lot of people who are using Gulp, and this is in no way meant as a slight to them, it's just a fact, they're not necessarily node developers. People are embedding uh, Gulp in PHP, they're embedding Gulp in Python. Gulp is a general tool. Node is kind of like the defunct tool that people are, uh, defunct, default tool. <laughs> Oops. Um, it's the default tool that people are using for building a lot of front-end applications applications. So a lot of people who are getting this aren't necessarily super savvy in Node. They may be like, you know, some of the best developers on the planet, but like if you're not like really familiar with the like deep internals of Node and how things work, you're not really going to know what to do with the stack trace. So we really as as the core team need to be very confident and comfortable with the changes we make and make sure that we're not breaking people's things in a way they're not ready for. So to avoid breaking the world, I did a little reggae. That was my phone auto-corrected the word regex to reggae. So now you can call regex is reggae. Um, and you're going to recognize this code. <laughs> so I wrote a regular expression into GracefulFS that would backport to the old versions that essentially would like look for like a specific regular expression that would only exist in versions of Node that would be broken by this because we knew ES6 features only existed in the future versions. Um, and yeah, copy and pasted all that stuff. And we thought that it was fine, but unfortunately it was not enough. Um, we found that there was actually other projects that went all the way back down to Graceful FS1 and more so in the real issue here was that this solution wasn't scalable. Um, Yes, we could regular expression for like one internal util function and replace it, but we had a whole bunch of work that we were thinking about doing of like breaking up parts of our internals into um, like an internal util instead of being exposed interfaces because we don't support those interfaces. This would actually break our ability to do any of that moving forward on FS because we'd have to like essentially go into Graceful FS and copy and paste this for every single one of these breaking modules, which is not really that's not going to happen. It's going to make us all really sad. Um, and we actually almost went and gave up. Um, it was marked as blocked, and we almost went to the point where we said, you know, we're never going to be able to upgrade FS, and it's just going to kind of be a locked interface at this point. Um, until Isaacs came up with a really elegant solution. Um, he came up with this new uh, module that allowed us to land it uh, called Natives. Never use this, ever, <laughs> please. You can even see, um, I think, um, when your program is broken by changes to Node's internals or when Node changes in such a way that this module becomes fundamentally broken, you will likely get little sympathy. <laughs> Um, but basically, the natives module allows you to grab the source and execute the source for modules, and it will kind of like monkey patch things in a way where it actually allows for the internals to be grabbed at the time in which this is executing. It's weird, it's edgy, it's scary, um, but it worked. And we worked on backports to version 2 and version 1 of GracefulFS, and that's allowed us as a project to move forward with this stuff. Um, and as of Node 7, this is no longer a problem. We're able to move forward. Um, so dear diary, even though we broke lots and lots of stuff, uh, most people didn't notice. <laughs> and that's a reason to celebrate. Thank you very much. This is a picture of Jean-Luc Picard playing a flute. <laughs> Ba-ba-ba-ba-boom, 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 ba-ba-ba-